I can't believe it's already October. Um, it's it's crazy how fast life is going. And I, it, your initial reaction is, well, that's age. You know, the older you get, the faster things go. I don't know if that's the case. It just seems like things are flying by at record speed. I love the fall, though. I love October not nearly as much as my wife um, loves the fall and loves the whole Christmas time and everything coming. Um, we do need to kind of set the record straight that um, just because it's October does not mean you can decorate for Christmas yet. Um, we, we need to stop um, like premature Christmas decorations. Um, December is fine after Thanksgiving, but some of you crazy people are already saying, can we decorate for Christmas now? The answer is no. Um, but I love, I love this time of year. For some of us, it's hunting season. And for me, um, I love to hunt. It's always fun. But, but I love fishing a little bit more. And the best part about the fall is all the guys that hunt, they no longer fish. They leave the rivers and they go run around in the woods, which means we have the rivers all to ourselves, which is great. I love that together. I do want to know just to see if there's any people that are quite as crazy as I am. Just with a quick show of hands, if you, if you would say that you, not that you just like fishing, but you, you love fishing, not about like if I'm camping and there happens to be a pole, I'll go fishing, but you like, you love it. Any, any fisher, okay, there's a few of us in here. How many, how many would say that you have a problem and probably need intervention when it comes to fishing? Any, there's a couple of us. This is, uh, this is me, and it's interesting as I, I serve as, this is kind of an exciting week because I'm on a couple of different boards. Uh, this is actually my last Sunday as president of our state convention of churches. Uh, we have our meeting in Kalispell this week in which someone else will be reelected. I've served two terms. You can only serve two terms, uh, and so I'm excited. It's been the honor of my life, but it's been a lot of work, so I'm glad to, to be done with that. But I also serve as the uh, vice president of Trout Unlimited for our area. And the only reason I do that is because I can talk in front of people. And if you know fishermen, you know that they just don't like to talk. So I started going 20 years ago to this club, uh, Trout Unlimited, and, and, and no one could talk in front of people without just totally botching it up. And so I ended up kind of being the guy up front that would talk. And that one thing led to another. Here's, what's, here's what I've learned over the years about fishing, especially fly fishing, but other sports as well. Well, there's two types of people. There's those that love fishing, and then there's those that love the concept of fishing. And, and here's what I mean by that. We have probably more than half the people in our club that, that they just like the fly fishing life. They have the clothes, they have the shirts, they have the hats, they have, may even have a boat. They probably tie flies, they have a bunch of fly rods. But when you ask them, and like we get back from the, the year like we did, or from the summer like we did a month ago at our September meeting, I'd say, hey, you, did you get to fish this summer? How was it? Where'd you go? That kind of stuff. And, and over half of them would be like, oh, I didn't really get a chance to get out. I'm like, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard of. They love the concept of it. They just don't go fishing. And I've never really understood that. And I'm sure that happens in, in many different areas of life. Um, but one, one thing that's interesting is if you want to be good at fishing, this is revolutionary, this will change your life, you have to go fishing, right? I mean, you would think that would be obvious, but, but sometimes it's not. I also... Watched a documentary. There's a bunch of uh, 18 to you know 30 year old kids that 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 probably because they've spent so much time on video games and professional high tech flight simulators that they could most likely successfully take off and land a 747 plane, but they've never flown a plane. They just know how to do it. And then there's some in this documentary, and and some of you may be asking, why are you watching a documentary on that? Don't ask me that. You know how it works. You see one little video, and that leads you to YouTube, and next thing you know, you're seven hours into how to fly a 747. Total waste of time, I know, but weird how it happens. And some of them have never even been in a plane, which is kind of crazy to think of, that they could land one, but they've never, 
been in one. There's areas in life, if you want to be good at it, and you want to do it successfully, you have to actually do it, not just, not just talk about it. And we're going to talk more about that in just a minute. Um, if you've been with us for a little while, we're on, what is this, 26, week 26 of the longest sermon series of my life, um, walking through the Old Testament, trying to paint a picture of how the Old Testament is more than just history. The Old Testament paints a picture of our need for Jesus and our need for redemption. You cannot read the Old Testament without getting caught up in some of the gory details that are in the Old Testament. And if you've never read the Bible and you like the kind of the gory stuff, read the Old Testament. Read First and Second Kings. It's, it's amazing what happens in those, those books. But um, it's more than just that. It's, it's to show that by ourselves, we can't do it without a Redeemer. We can't do it without someone coming in to save the day and fixing the problems that we deal with. And so we're calling the, the series The Story of Redemption through the Old Testament. And we'll end up um, just a couple of weeks, actually, at the end of November in the book of Malachi uh, before we usher in this Redeemer, this Jesus Christ who was born to be that Redeemer for us on, on earth. As we read through this, here's what you notice. Um, there are a lot of verses that we don't talk about in Vacation Bible School. Like if you've been through Vacation Bible School or, or you went through confirmation, you learned some of the stories in the Bible of Jonah and the whale and the parting of the Red Sea and, and the exodus out of Egypt. You've learned through some of these stories, but when you see the backstory of it, there's some things we don't talk about. For instance, the book of Deuteronomy, there are twice as many warnings in the book of Deuteronomy, as there are blessings. But, but most scholars think the book of Deuteronomy is, is, is a book about blessings, about how God loves us, which he does. Um, I was talking to someone earlier about how um, they went to a funeral, and, and the person said that, that, that we're all wrapped in God's love, which we are. We're also all wrapped in God's judgment, and, and his justice. And so we can't really separate those two. There are some warnings throughout the Bible. And here's what's interesting. Two, two different concepts, but, but in, the New, in the New Testament, do you know that Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the letters in the New Testament? And so if you're new to kind of the whole Bible thing, what, what you, what's interesting is once you get past Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, once you get past the book of Acts, you start to see that the rest of those books are basically emails that, that Paul sent to churches to say, now that Jesus has resurrected and we know Jesus is Lord, how do we live? How do we, how do, we do what he told us to do? You know, in all of those books, Paul never prays that you or I or anyone he's dealing with would be healed from a physical ailment that they're going through. Never praise that. But he prays several times that while we're going through that illness, that it would draw us closer to God. And, that, and that's like an epiphany when you read that. You think, yeah, we want to be healthy. We want to be healed from what we're going through health-wise. Paul doesn't pray for that. Paul prays that when you're going through it, you'll draw closer to God. Here's the other thing in the Old Testament. Um, they're never warned to look out for or deal with or be afraid of. They're never warned about other countries like the Philistines, the Canaanites, the Assyrians, the Armenians, the Romans. We're never warned to be afraid of those people because the writers in the Old Testament knew they're not the threat. The threat doesn't come from something outside. The threat is sin in our own life. If anything is going to destroy us, it's going to be the sin in our own life, not something from outside forces. It's crazy. Um, as a matter of fact, several times he even says, don't fear those other things, but deal with the sin in your life. How relevant is that for us? As 
as Americans, um, and I know some of you, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because you wouldn't do it anyway. Some of you are what we call preppers, right? And, and you're waiting for everything to fall apart because you have like a year's worth of food and you're storing up water and you bought like a case of salt in case the money system falls and you know that you're going to have to trade salt for medicines and all those other types of stuff. And you're like, you're crazy. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to expose you. But, but you, you kind of want everything to fall apart because you know you would survive in that sort of, sort of scenario. Um, and you kind of hope that not that there's a nuclear war because that would kill a lot of people but you kind of hope that there's an emp and if you don't know what an emp is you're not a prepper so it doesn't matter and so you got your faraday bags all set up and you're like you're ready to go man you're you're ready to do this thing um that's not our biggest threat our biggest threat doesn't come from russia it doesn't come from china our biggest threat doesn't come from the opposing political party Wherever you land politically, the greatest threat doesn't come from this person getting elected or someone else getting elected. Our greatest threat comes from within us, from from within our lives doing that which separated us from God in the first place. And Micah talks specifically about that. So we're in the book of Micah today. And um, if you're following along closely, you're like, wait a minute, we're out of order. Well, we're not following the the order of your table of contents. We're following a chronological order of the writings in the Old Testament. So in the book of Micah, um, we see some of these interesting passages. And Micah is a book that is kind of like Genesis um, chapters 1, 2, and 3, and then also kind of like Revelation, depending on what your view of eschatology is, how you think the world's going to end. Um, but but it's not chronological. It's not like this and this and this and this. It's what we call cyclical. It's, it's this happens, and then the next chapter, let me tell you more about what this happens, the chapters after that. Let me tell you more about those other two. Um, if you've ever read Genesis, you see this. Genesis paints a picture of creation. And then the second chapter, um, it talks about that same creation with a little bit more detail. Um, And so you see that the first couple of chapters are kind of cyclical in nature. That's what the book of Micah is. And Micah has three visions, and these visions give us judgment. They give us hope. And it's like a perfectly laid out sermon file in the book of Micah. And so we're going to cover that today. Micah has the same theme that most of the prophets have, and it's this. The theme is our sin is great. We're not not going to candy coat that fact. Our sin is great, but our Savior is greater. The only difference between us and them is that we live post Jesus Christ being our Savior. And so this was the theme throughout most of the prophets. He goes over a couple of things that we're going to talk about, about why why this should be important to us and why it should change us. We're going to fill in some blanks kind of quick and go through some things. Here's the first warning that Micah gives his people, and you're going to think that this may have been written in 2023 because it certainly applies. The first danger he warns them out is the danger of what he calls spiritual complacency. Spiritual complacency. And as I try to find the word, it's kind of hard when I was doing this to kind of figure the right word. But what that means is um, getting comfortable in our faith. And if you've gone for a long time without a tragedy, without a health issue, without a relationship issue, what you find is it's easy to get comfortable in your faith for whatever reason. And it's the truth, and there's probably a million reasons why, but for whatever reason, when we're going through hard times, we normally use those times to draw closer to God when things are tough. But when things go well, We don't pull away from God, but we just don't put enough emphasis on it. And so Micah warns them 2,000 or 4,000 years ago, 3,800 some years ago, there's a danger to this spiritual complacency, to being being easy with our faith and not going through it. Um, Chapter 2 kind of says that they're going through religious motions. They're just doing things because they've always done them. Look at some of these verses. This is great. This first one hurts, um, especially as, as a pastor. 
Micah chapter 2, verse 6 starts out and says, do not preach. He's getting ready to tell us what not to preach. He says, do not preach. Thus, they preach anyway. But do not preach that one should not preach of such things. Disgrace will not overtake us. What he's basically saying is, um, quit your preaching and, and quit griping about things and make some physical change. Because what you're doing now is not working, and we need to deal with why it's not working. The reason it wasn't working wasn't Assyria, it wasn't the Romans, it wasn't the, the Chaldeans. The reason it wasn't working was their own sin. And we see this in every stinking book we read. I don't know how obvious it is that when the people of God, when the sin overtakes them, they end up going into captivity. They never saw this, evidently. I don't know if they did or didn't, um, but, but they never saw this coming, and they just wonder, does God love us? Maybe God doesn't love us. But he's basically saying, do what it is that changes your heart. Now, here are some things I know. Um, and we talk to church planters quite a bit, but there's some easy ways to grow a church. One, preach on God's love and his mercy and his grace. Because we all want to know that God loves us and he gives us grace, gives us those things we don't deserve, and he gives us mercy when, when we don't get what we probably deserve. We love preaching on that stuff. Um, another thing that if you want to grow a church, you preach on sex. That's always a really hot topic. And, and preach on how to be financially rich. Like you preach on those things, you'll grow a church. You want to know how to kill a church? Preach out of the book of Micah. Um, preach on repentance and justice and sovereignty and the sin in our own life. Now, my hope is not to kill the church. We're just going through the books of the Bible. So if you're like, I don't want to hear about judgment and repentance, um, talk to God about that. I didn't write this stuff. I'm just telling you what, what was written. So we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, today. <clears throat> it's interesting. Look at Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. It says, The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. So, so read that. Make sure you got that down. Because when you read that, you're like, yes, that's what I want. That's, that's what I want to hear about. I want to hear about he's slow to anger because I'm going to jack it all up. And, and when I do, I don't want him to get angry with me. I want him to be gracious and merciful, um, having steadfast love. We could preach on that all day long. And so we read that verse and we close our Bible and we're like, that's who God is. It might behoove us to read, read the next verse. Um, because it, it changes just a little bit. The very next verse, verse 7, says, um, hold on, let me show you. He's, he's abounding in love and steadfast love and in faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression of sin. And we're like, that's what I'm talking about. Just forgive me. I know I shouldn't have done it. I know it was bad. I knew it was bad when I was doing it. I knew it was bad before I did it, but I still did it. Talk to me about forgiving iniquity and transgression of sin. This is, this is perfect. This is right where we want to be. But the next part of the verse, forgiving iniquity and transgression of sins. But, that's where we go. Oh, close the Bible real quick. Don't, don't keep reading. But, who will by no means clear the guilty. Right? Justice has to happen. God is just visiting. Let me just say off the bat, I don't understand this part of the verse, but let me read it to you. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. Here's what that means. But for those who have sin that's uncontrolled, in some way, there's going to be judgment, not just to you, but to your children and to your grandchildren and to your great-great-grandchildren. We're not done yet. And to your great-great-grandchildren. Multi-generational sin, multi-generational consequences. To them, here's what this meant. Because your great-great-great-grandfather 
got caught up in sin, you are experiencing the judgment of that sin in the Old Testament. Now, I don't understand how that works. I do not understand multi-generational sin. But I'll tell you what I do understand. Multi-generational consequences. And you understand that too. Because some of you are living in a world and it affects your relationships and your money and your trust issues and your faith. It affects everything because of a, a mistake or a sin that mom and dad got wrapped up in or grandma and grandpa got wrapped up in. And through the generations, it's still affecting you. You're still dealing with it. And so this is how Micah starts off his, uh, his message. He says that, that this, is, this is the God that we serve. And, and sometimes we're just guilty of going through the motions and playing church. We cannot become spiritually complacent. Now, what else does he talk about? The next one he says, but before, before we just get down on ourselves, there's freedom to being renewed excuse me, to being renewed spiritually. So, so we, if we don't become complacent, to become complacent is a bad thing, but if we change from that and renew ourselves spiritually, there's amazing things that happen. There's freedom that happens when we renew ourselves spiritually. And so that's Micah's encouragement. First part, <clears throat> justice <clears throat> excuse me, justice and, and, and the power of God um, being sovereign and dealing with sin. The next part is, but if there's to be some renewal, some spiritual renewal, there's so much freedom in that. Micah verse, chapter 3, verse 12. Um, you, sounds kind of weird, but you may realize this verse as we're still talking about it in 2023. Micah 3, verse 12 says, Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins and the mountain, uh, excuse me, and the mountain of the house, a wooded height. And so one, it's kind of hard to understand, but here's what it's saying. Zion, the special place of worship will be torn down and turned into a wasteland. Okay, and if you're reading Micah's letter, you're like, okay, that doesn't sound good. Right? It's basically saying the most holy place, which is called the Temple Mount, the most holy place will be torn down and destroyed. This is the place where it's said that Abraham sacrificed Isaac. The Sunni Muslims also believe this is the place where Muhammad ascended into heaven. Here's, here's how you can tell um, a religion is fake. How you can tell a religion is faked is that if someone comes up with something really good and then 800 to 1,000 years later, someone else does something similar on that same spot, you're kind of like, yeah, you're kind of you're looking for something, right? I heard this said um, a while ago, which is kind of cool. Um, Trump, whether you like him or not, first president ever to create a brand, Right before it was just president. So think back through your tenure of how many presidents you've lived under. Um, no one had a brand like the MAGA brand. Like you wear, you wear that brand, and instantly you're going to get high fived, and it's either going to be in the hand or in the face. Right? <laughs> People either love you or they hate you because of the brand. He he did the first thing that no one else had ever done is he, he created this, this brand. And what's crazy is, is now um, Joe Biden and his team, they, they really tried their hardest to do the same thing because it makes sense. If he created a brand, let's create our own brand. Um, the problem is it, it turned really bad at a NASCAR event and went downhill from there. So I don't know how else to explain it, but, but he has a brand, but not a brand you want. Right. And and so it's crazy when you look at religions, what one person did and had major success, people try to copy that. And so on this Temple Mount, the Sunni Muslims, all of a sudden, this is their most holy place a thousand years after it was already the most holy place for the Hebrews. Micah said it's going to be torn down. It's going to be turned to ruins. We're talking about something 
um, that was written about in the 8th century B.C. 8th century B.C. is still probably the most contested spot of real estate on the planet. Whoever controls the Temple Mount ultimately control the world. And we're talking about it. There's still news articles about what's going on on this special holy spot. Micah says it's going to be turned into a wasteland. If you're not familiar with that, um, go all the way to the New Testament. Remember Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well? She says, our father worshipped on this mountain. But you say in Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship on the Temple Mount. So she's referencing, if I want to worship, I have to go to this Temple Mount. And then listen to what Jesus said. Jesus says, but an hour is coming. Actually, it's now here when true worship, first will worship the Father in spirit and truth for the Father is seeking these type of people to worship him. He's basically saying, um, now that Jesus is here, it's no longer about real estate. It's about worshiping God wherever you are, not just the Temple Mount. So what Micah did is he said, we can't become spiritually complacent. Our holy places that we love so much, they're going to be torn down. I watched, uh, listened to a podcast that's normally really uplifting, and I had to travel this week in eastern Montana. There's nothing in eastern Montana, by the way. If you've never driven out there, you should or, or shouldn't. It's just nothing. So I was listening to a podcast, the most depressing podcast I've ever listened to from two guys I really respect. Basically, it's called the, the de-churching of America and how people are, are falling away in, in droves, not just in hundreds or thousands, but in millions, and many of them for no real good reason. And so we, we think that this church life, this religion that we've always held so close, there's a danger that it may not exist at some point. Now, I, I'm sure there will be images of it, and I'm sure it'll just go through a change. But Mike is saying that everything is going to be destroyed if we don't spiritually renew ourselves. So how, how do we do this? What is the process of spiritual renewal? And Michael tells us pretty plain. We're going to go through that kind of quick. What's the process of, of, of being different? Here's why this is important. Um, I tried to, I, I'm, I don't know if it's by old age or what, but I'm trying to come up with really good words to use for some of this stuff, and it's so hard to do. And so, yeah, it's kind of a process, kind of not a process. And spiritual renewal, that doesn't excite you. Like, I was at um, uh, an event. I don't want to say too much. I don't want to give it away, but a, a men's event and where men get together. And they're like, we're not going to sing. We're not going to hold hands. We're just going to do men's stuff. They had animal, like dead animals on the wall, you know, trophies around. We had like rattlesnake and all this stuff we were eating. It was a man's event. The speaker decked out in camo and he's just, you know, he's like the manly man. I'm like, this is what I'm talking about. I love it. This is exactly what I want. Matter of fact, we have a men's ministry here that we call Fight Club, right? Because if you're, if you're like a guy, you're like, I, I, I don't want, I, I don't want a color on construction paper. I don't want to hold hands. I don't even want to meet the guy next to me. I certainly don't want to sing, right? Um, that's, that's just, I, I just want to do manly stuff. So this is a manly event. And, and as the guy's preaching, like, a good sermon, but his, the climax of this sermon, the thing that's going to drive men to the altar of God in droves is he's like, um, I'll probably get it wrong, but it's something to the effect of you know, crawling up in Abba Father. You talk about Abba Father, which kind of means daddy. Crawling up in, in daddy's arms and feeling his warm embrace. And I'm sitting there as a pastor, and I'm like looking around at people and like, that's weird. <laughs> I mean, right, if you're, a guy, if, you're, if you're a girl and you had a good relationship with your dad, or maybe you didn't, that whole imagery, you're like, yeah, man, I'm tracking with that. If you're a guy, um, I don't want to cuddle with you. There, there's, you know, I love Jeff Roop. Man, man of God, leads his family well, supports his pastors on our leadership team. Um, he's just, he's that, he's a black belt, you know, all this martial arts stuff. I asked him years ago, I'm like, it's kind of weird knowing that you could kill me with a plastic spoon. And he looks at me straight faced and goes, I don't need a spoon. I'm like, holy cow, you'd never know because he's so full of love. Um, 
Jeff and I aren't going to cuddle, right? And so w- what happens, yeah, it, it's true. We, we want to we see... We want to see the power of God in our lives. And we want to be able to do, we want to have a relationship with God that fits who God created us to be. If, if I could have um, a couple of hours with Jesus, I wouldn't want to sit in a coffee shop. I certainly wouldn't crawl into his lap. That would be weird. I just, I'd want to drive in an old truck two hours to go hunting or fishing somewhere have that windshield time to talk. And so maybe with you, it'd be different. You would want that, that embrace because God, in a weird way, can provide all of that. But wherever you are, we want the power of God to move in our life. We want that. We want the power of God to affect our marriages, our children, our jobs, our money, everything. But how do we get there? How does, that, how does that really happen in a way in which God created us? That's what we have to figure out. And let me just be honest. One of my jobs as a pastor is to kind of say the things that you've always thought, but you're kind of thinking maybe you shouldn't say. Um, if we can't experience the power of God in our individual lives, all of this that we do is a total waste of time. It really is. I mean, yes, we give praise and honor and glory to God, which that may be enough, but, but we want to see the power of God flowing through us like the New Testament promises it will. How do we get there? How does that happen? And Micah would say it happens through this process of spiritual renewal. And the steps are going to kind of blow you away because they're so incredibly simplistic. How do we walk with God and experience spiritual renewal? Here's the first one. Um, we learn the ways of God. So we're going to take kind of a two or three step approach to how this happens. Here's the, the first one. The first one's kind of easy. We, we learn the ways of God. Micah 4, 2 says, um, and many nations shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and we may walk in his path. And so this, this sentence right here is important. Um, how do we start this spiritual renewal? The first step is this. You got to know what pleases the heart of God. You got to know how to experience that power. We have to be taught his ways. This is what we call head knowledge. We got to know the stuff. Um, if you've ever been with like, say a new Christian, it's so incredibly exciting because Uh, They love Jesus and they love sharing Jesus. They just don't know the things they're supposed to do and things they're not supposed to do. We'll get guys that um, they're called into the ministry and they want to go plant a church. And somewhere they find a bunch of money to plant a church. And not only that, but they find a bunch of people to go with them to plant a church. So they head off to Bozeman and they plant this church. It's going to be great. Um, But because they've never done it before. They don't really have a great head knowledge of what to do. They Sometimes they do some things that would make another pastor who's been around a while scratch his head and go, you you can't really do that. I mean, you have people that you have to love on, people that you have to care about. So there's there's something really significant about a head knowledge. You got to know what's right and what's wrong. You teach that to your kids all the time, right? Sometimes your kids will do things that they have no idea is wrong. They have no idea that, that they're not supposed to do it. Um, we, we have this thing where we watch football games at our house, and when, when Oklahoma plays, we kind of have this rule that um, the carpeted area between our chairs and couches and stuff, um, during the game, especially during the, the plays, you don't walk on the carpet because you make a better door than you do a window, right? I can't see through you. And yesterday... Um, I don't know that I've ever had this conversation with with my daughter face-to-face about it. But we're in the middle of the game. I'm sitting there in the recliner, and she's on the couch, and it's like fourth and one. And she she comes, and she, like, walks straight toward me on the carpet, which is a no-no. And and then in the middle, she realizes what she did. And as she's walking, she's like, oh, sorry. And then she, like, goes and scoots by the couch and comes over the sideway to me to show me something that she's watching. 
And I'm like, I don't know that I ever taught her that. I just said, this is kind of the way we do it. But if, she, if you don't know, you can't really be guilty of it. You know, I mean, yes, I spanked her because you don't walk on the carpet. But, <laughs> and then she's like, why am I getting spanked? And I'm like, I'll tell you after the game. Don't worry about it. No, I, of course I didn't do that because she didn't know, right? So here's, here's the first step to spiritual renewal. You got to have some head knowledge. You got to know what it is that God's calling you how you treat people. Otherwise, what you end up with is, is this thought that we want to conquer everyone else, not love everyone else. That we want, we want to defeat everyone else that doesn't believe what we believe, not provide for and help those people. So you have to have this head knowledge, and head knowledge is extremely important. But then there's another step. And this other step kind of goes on top of it. So you learn, here's the last one we did, you learn the ways of God, but then you choose to walk in his path. The next step to spiritual renewal is making a choice, now that I have a head knowledge, to walk in the ways of God, to walk in his path, to do what God has taught us to do, to do what we have just learned about why it's important. This is where... Okay, follow this. This is where head knowledge, right, the things you know in your head, just information, doesn't save you, doesn't do anything for you. It's pure head knowledge. This is where head knowledge just causes your heart to change, to be transformed because you've made a choice to follow God. And that's why this is so incredibly important. What he's saying is choosing to do what's right, choosing to walk with God every day in every moment. That is where the power of God comes from. So you got to have some head knowledge and you got to choose to do it. You got to choose to walk in the paths of God. Listen to this verse um, that I love in Psalms 119.11. You probably, you probably heard this verse before. Um, it says, I have stored up my word in your heart. Um, and depending on what translations you have, it may say, thy word have I hid in my heart. So here's what this means. I know what the Bible teaches. I have a good head knowledge. And I have a good head knowledge about Scripture so that I can do some things. Right? So it's going to change. So here's what it could be. This is from the King Greg version of the Bible. If I ever get some money, I'm going to write my own version of the Bible. Here's some options. A word have I stored up in my heart that I might win when I play Bible trivia. Right? Because that's important. You've got to show off in front of your, your people. I think I've told this story before, but probably wasn't living the best life I could have when I got to college. And so I went to a Baptist college, Samford, not Stanford, University in Birmingham, Alabama for the first couple of years. I was a preacher's kid, knew a lot about the Bible, and no one knew it. So we're in this sorority house, and on like a Tuesday evening, and we're playing Bible trivia. And so they started picking teams, like who should be on what team. And, and you know who the last person picked was? Me. Because they're like, Greg didn't know anything about the Bible. And it actually went down. This girl, Heather, she's like, okay, we'll take, we'll take Greg. <laughs> Give me that sm I'm like, what was that? Come on. So... I go, um, we stomped them. I mean, I, I knew basically every answer. And I think we, I found one answer in the Bible trivia game that was wrong. We actually ended up proving that, no, that answer in the game was wrong. Um, so I've stored up your word in my heart so that I can win when I play these games, right? You know that's probably not it. How about this one? Um, a word have I stored up in my heart that I might look really smart in my life group, right? Because I got all my people around me. And when they ask a question, I want to know the answer, and I want people to go, wow, he's a really godly person. He really knows the Scriptures. So maybe that's why we hide God's Word in our heart, which, you know, that's not true. Here's the one you probably thought of before. Maybe you didn't say it out loud. But I've stored up your Word in my heart that I might receive the blessings because, dadgummit, I deserve it. I've been through so much, I just deserve some blessings. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read the Bible, I'm going to get a bunch of knowledge, and then God's going to bless me because I have a bunch of knowledge. And it, and it makes sense. Because I can't ask God for blessings because he's going to say, well, what does my word tell about this? And you're like, 
I don't, I don't know what your word says. And so we feel that in order to be blessed by God, we got to know. And you can see on the bottom, anytime it says KGV, that's King Greg version, by the way. So we just do that to make sure. It's not, not the Bible yet. It's going to be when I write it. But uh, it's not the word of God, definitely, because it's a mess is what that is. Um, but, but that surely can't be it. Listen to what the actual Bible says. Where do I store it up in my heart that I might not sin against you. So I gain all of this knowledge for the purpose of not sinning, to walk in the way that Jesus would have me walk, to be able to experience the things that he has and so that I won't sin. But we don't like to talk about that because it's uncomfortable because we all have sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And so what he's saying is a head knowledge changes your heart so that you don't sin against God because that's that's the important part. Now here is my greatest fear. My greatest fear is a group of people with a head knowledge but no heart transformation. And you've probably met those people. And you probably know people who have church scars because They ran into those people who have a bunch of head knowledge but have no heart transformation. Here's here's what this looks like. Here's how this plays out. If you have a, a big head knowledge and someone's going through a tough time in their life and all you have is head knowledge, you you would say to that person, Well, you just need to to stop sinning and change your life because you're just experiencing the judgment of God and and you gotta change it. And you become judgmental. Whereas if your heart has been transformed and you see someone going through a hard time, your instant thought is, how can I pray for you? How can I help you? And how can I hope that you experience the grace of God? All right, let me, let me touch a wound with you for a second. You ever met those people that, I don't want to say you're in competition with, but maybe you work with, maybe you live with, maybe they're, they're on a team of yours or something, and... And you just rub each other the wrong way. And, and when something good happens in their life, maybe it's like an enemy from high school or something, and something good happens in their life, there's a part of you that gets angry, doesn't it? They don't deserve that. They, they sh- why didn't that happen to me? It shouldn't have happened to them. I knew a guy when I sold insurance in Oklahoma that, that just was awful morally, everything just just totally separated from God. Worst thing in the world that could have happened to him was a May 3rd tornado that came and destroyed everything that he owned and ended up with with a multi-million dollar building and millions of dollars and no paper record for his entire life. And it was just wonderful. And I'm like, this guy fell into a pot of gold. And, And your first reaction is it kind of makes you angry. That's because you have a head knowledge, but not a heart knowledge. And when people irritate you and and when they cut you off in traffic, or when they cut in front of you in line, or they do or say something, or they have a bumper sticker on your car that you really don't agree with, and your first reaction is judgment, may mean that you have a head knowledge, but your heart hasn't been transformed. Micah says that that this is important as we not become spiritually complacent, that we renew ourselves because there's a process um, behind it. This will destroy friendships, it'll destroy life groups, it'll destroy churches. It's just judgmental people that have a head knowledge but, but don't have a heart knowledge. Um, look, look on at Micah chapter 6, verse 7. Or excuse me, chapter 6, verse 6. He says, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Those are expensive calves, evidently. Will the Lord be be pleased with thousands of rams and ten thousands of rivers of oil. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgressions, for the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? And what Mike is saying is, how, how do I experience the power of God? Do I just give stuff over and over and over? Do I just do, I just do things? This is a head knowledge. 
Here's why. Because I've heard that giving produces benefits. And I heard that sacrifice is a good thing. And so I'm going to do that so that God will be happy with me, but my heart doesn't change. Okay, I'm going to give you a fair warning. You're going to see verses similar to this for the next three weeks. The prophet saying, stop doing the church things. Religion is not going to save you if it doesn't change your heart. I, I know for a fact, and I don't even know what percentage, but I think it would shock us of how many people come to churches just like this every single Sunday morning because it's something that they've always done and they feel like they probably should if they want to have a good week next week. And there's nothing wrong with coming for those reasons. But my hope would be that I'm coming not just because I've always done it, but because I want to experience transformation. I want the power of God in my life, in my marriage, in my family, in my job. I want to experience those things in a deeper, deeper level. Not just change my behavior, not just become more religious, but a real heart transformation. Um, This verse could read, and I don't have a slide for this, but this word, um, this verse could read, shall I come to... Uh, Shall I come before him with 20% tithe instead of 10%? What if I just double my tithe? Then God will be like, oh, good job. Gave so much. Now I'm going to bless you. Now you're going to get to experience the power of God. Or it could say, for the next part of the verse, excuse me, "Will will the Lord be pleased with me if I pull weeds in a parking lot or if I serve in the nursery? I mean, that's got to make God happy. Or maybe, shall I go overseas and become a missionary? Or should I give all my money to the homeless? All of us seeking to please God, to experience his power, there's a right way and there's a wrong way to do it. And the wrong way to do it is for us to sit here every Sunday morning in these blue chairs and think, I just want to change my behavior. If you leave out of these doors thinking, I need to change my behavior, um, And that's the end all. You've missed the point of what God's trying to tell you. God's trying to tell you, change your heart. And when you change your heart, your behavior will follow. Mike is telling us this. Isaiah is going to tell us this plain and day. It's not a change in behavior. It's literally a heart transformation. So what do we do? How how do we make sure it's not? This is the verse in Micah that you've probably heard. They've even written songs about it. It's a pretty popular verse. Uh, Micah chapter 6. Verse 8, he says, O people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you. So you should probably take notes. This is what God requires of you to do, um, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. And so if, if we just kind of divide those up a little bit, here's the first one. This is what the Lord requires of you to do what is right. Here's what that means. And it's so simple but the hardest thing you'll ever do. It means make your next decision the right decision. All the times you messed it up in the past, you can't go back and fix that. But here's what you do. The next decision that you're faced with, to sin or not to sin, to obey or not to obey, to to walk in the ways of God or not walk in the ways of God, the next decision that you're faced, make it the right decision. That's not so hard. Well, yeah, but what about a week from now and a month from now and next year I have to forget all that. Here's what the Lord requires. Do what is right. Make your next decision, the one that's right in front of you, make that the right decision. He goes on and he says, um, do what is right and to love mercy. To love mercy. All right, let's have a talk. I'm not trying to offend anyone because I'm just as guilty as this as, as the next person. You don't have to win every argument. Um, You don't have to win every argument face to face. You don't have to win every argument on social media. You don't have to prove that you're right. You can allow a little bit of mercy to slip in. Have you ever read, and it always happens in um, like these community groups, someone will ask something and And there's this feeling that comes over as we're like, we need to answer this and tell them how much of an idiot they are. And it's it's crazy. And you start typing this big, long thing. Here's the best thing to do. Type it out. Type it out. 
run it through Grammarly, put it through chat, GPT, put, you know, make this, this wonderful statement of how much of a blazing idiot they are, and then delete it, right? Because you don't have to win every argument. Here's what the Lord requires, to do what is right, and to love mercy, to stop fighting. Now, are there some battles that we want to be involved in? Yes. Are there some things we want to stand for? Yes. But sometimes, put down the sword. You know, we don't have to fight. Jesus didn't. You realize Jesus could have called down a million angels and destroyed the earth instantly while he was on the cross, but he didn't. Matter of fact, he prayed, Father, forgive them. You know what, you know what forgiveness means? It means don't count their acts against them. Don't make them pay for what they have done. And that's what Jesus is praying while these guys are taking his life. So do the next best thing. Do the next right thing to love mercy. You don't have to win every argument. And the last part, he says, is to walk humbly with your God. Uh, this means you depend on God rather than yourself. Um, not taking pride in what we do. We're not professionals. We're not taking pride in how good we are for God. And we just spent the past 26 weeks talking about how we desperately need a Savior. So this is pretty obvious. So we make the next decision the right decision. We love mercy. We put down the sword. We don't have to win every argument. And we walk humbly. We realize that, that God himself is, is the power that we have in our lives, and it's not us. I almost had one of these moments scrolling through a social media account. I heard a guy talking about um, uh, Alice Cooper is like some... Anybody know the name Alice Cooper? <laughs> yeah, you're like, I can't raise my hand because I wasn't allowed to listen to that stuff. My mother, sitting right in the front, would not let me listen to Alice Cooper. She caught my sister, um, wow, who was just a disaster growing. I'm just kidding. I love her to death. Caught my sister with an Alex Cooper record and, like, took it away, a record. That's like a, a big CD. You don't know what a CD is. It's like iTunes on a round Frisbee. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> But caught, caught with that because Alice Cooper's awful. Google, watch some Alice Cooper videos when you get home. It's okay. Tell your mom you're going to, I'm sorry, I'm going to listen to Alice Cooper. Homeboy's like an evangelist. He still has his tattoos and all. Jesus has changed the man's life. And what this guy was saying was, this is going to be great. All these deadhead rock and rollers from, you know, from the 70s and 80s, they're all going to turn to Jesus. And there's some of you in here, you're these old deadhead stone, you know, heavy metal guys. You can't hear what I'm saying because your ears are gone, but that's you. <laughs> and he's like, it's going to change the world. Everyone's become a Christian. No, it's not. It's not because it's not about Alice Cooper. It's about Jesus Christ. And so Micah says, you make the next decision right. You put down the sword, you live in mercy, and you walk humbly, realizing it's not you, but it's God himself. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes just for a minute. And I want to read you the last three verses of, of the book of Micah. Here's how he finishes this. Here's what he said. He's basically said, stop playing church. Deal with the sin that's in your life if you want to experience the power of God. I know that throughout this whole entire room, there are people that are praying over something and you want God to show up and kick the door down and you want the power of God to fill that situation so there's no doubt it was God. And you're praying earnestly for that. I want that for you. I think God wants that for you. And Micah says, here's the way you get to that. You deal with the biggest threat, and it's your own sin. Why is it your own sin? Because it's what separates you from that power. So, so do what is right. Love mercy. And walk humbly before God. Here's how Micah ends his book. He says, who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity or pardoning sin and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. He's talking about you and me because we're not paying for multi generational sins because of Jesus. He goes on and he says, He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. 
pretend as though Mike is writing this directly to you. He says, he will again have compassion on you. And he will tread your iniquities under his foot. And you will cast all your sins into the depths of the sea. God will show faithfulness to the house of Jacob. God will show faithfulness to the church. And steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. This is what God, how he wants to react. So isn't it time we start walking with God in all things? Isn't it time to do what is right? To love mercy? To walk humbly before God? I said in the beginning, if you want to be a good fisherman, you have to actually fish. If you want to be good at something, you have to actually do it. I'd also argue if you want to see the power of God, you got to walk with God. You got to spend time with the one that's giving you the power. You have to spend time with the one that's forgiven you of your sins. And I know it's hard for us sometimes. We get complacent, we get busy. But let me ask maybe today you renew your commitment to spending time with your Heavenly Father. I know you're busy and I know you have stuff to do. Then then take two or three minutes a day. Spend time in the presence of God. I would say every man and woman here, you want to experience the power of God in your life. You want God to come into your life and do miracles. And I would argue he wants to do the same thing. So spend time with him. Start with what matters most. I'm going to pray out loud, and as I do, I'm going to ask you to pray in, in whatever area you feel God's leading you to. Maybe you would say, I, I haven't made the next decision the right decision. Or maybe you would say, I don't give mercy. I'm so quick to cast out judgment. And I know you would never say that out loud, and most people don't even know, but you know. Or maybe you would say, it's time for me to walk humbly with God to deal with the sin in my life. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, your grace and your mercy covers us. Your redemption gives us freedom, and for that, we praise you. God, we pray that the Rock Church, that the the people that make up this gathering, that we don't ever become complacent, that Our sin is always in front of us. There's a constant daily battle that we're literally living a life of maintenance, dealing with these things that separate us from you. And so God, help us pick them out one by one because we want to see the power of God fall in our lives. God, for the person here today that needs an extra touch from you, that they need to feel your presence in a way they've never felt it before, God, we pray for that reality, for the marriage that needs to be healed, for the finances that need to be shaped, for the person that's scared because their body's not doing what it should. There's medical problems down the road. We pray for for healing. But in all of those things, we pray that this situation draws them closer to you. Because there and only there will they find comfort, will they find hope, and will they find redemption. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for pouring your wrath that should have been for my sin and pouring it on Jesus Christ so that I can walk in holiness. God, lead us to the place where we worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us to learn to walk with you in all things. For it's in Jesus' heavenly and precious name we pray.